All right. Hey there, this is Leila Benitez James for Tell Tell Poetry. I'm a really uh, lucky duck because I'm sitting down with Katie Condon to talk poems and publishing and praying naked, which is the amazing title of her debut collection. And Praying Naked won the 2018 Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize and was published in 2020. Katie Condon's poetry also appears in The New Yorker, Ten House, and the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day. Katie has received support from Emory University, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and Enprint in Houston. She's an assistant professor of English at Southern Methodist University and lives in Dallas with her husband, the writer Richard Hermes. And uh, Katie, thank you so much for, for joining Telltale Tell today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here talking with you, Layla. Yeah, me too. Um, well, I'd like to just jump right in and ask about your writing process, like where you go for inspiration, um, what writers you love, and like, what do you do when you feel like you just absolutely can't write? Those are all really good questions. Um, I think in general, I go for inspiration to other poets. I read a lot. Um, and I think in Praying Naked specifically, I turned a lot to the poets who made me want to be a poet, like Walt Whitman and Frank O'Hara and Dorothea Lasky. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to think of our canons as sort of like communities or conversations of which I want to be a part. And so in, in the book and, and still now in my new poems, I, I sometimes borrow other poets' lines um, as a sort of starting point and, and either sort of revision them or revise them or speak back to them. Um, and I think, well, you, I'll give you a specific example. It, it's sort of different with every line or with every poet, but um, when I was writing this book and I was reading a lot of Whitman, uh, I was so drawn to Whitman's confidence and his sensuality. He sort of like oozes yeah. it. Like a sexy guy, I feel like. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and so one thing that struck me was um, at that time, I, I didn't know of many female poets who sort of oozed the same way. I think I should yeah. figure out a different verb. It sounds <laughs> a little strange, but you, you catch my drift. Yeah. And so I was interested in how... Um, Whitman's language would feel, you know, uttered from from a female speaker's mouth. And so there's one poem in the book where I, I sort of uh, use many of his lines from Song of Myself mm -hmm. uh, to sort of explore or hyperbolize or really just capture realistically like the possibilities of female sensuality. And and so that's one way that I, I, I hope I'm sort of expanding a conversation rather than um, anything else. So that's one place that I get inspiration. Um, yeah, well, and I love at the end of your book, you have you have like your notes. So you're like calling out the different poets that you are in conversation with. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. And um, it's something I love to do. And, and it is something that I also do. You know, you, another question you asked was, what do I do when I feel like I can't yeah. write? I feel stuck. And, and you know, reading is really helpful and, and just sort of consciously starting a conversation with, with another poet is really helpful. Um, but something else I do is I give myself um, like writing games or writing prompts. I find those really helpful to sort of get myself out of my own head. Um, this is my own experience. And I think probably people get writer's block, quote unquote, for many different reasons. But for me, whenever I feel stuck writing, it's often because I'm trying to prescribe something on a poem draft or decide what the poem's going to be about or do before I write it. Right. And prompts and games are a really helpful way to get out of that mindset. So that's some something else I do. I don't know if it's inspiration, but it's another way to start. Yeah, no, totally. And do you have like a favorite game or like favorite prompt that's like your go-to, like gets you out of your own head kind of thing? Yeah, my favorite thing to do is, is to collage. Um, so I'll like collect all of, first of all, I've kept all of my journals like way back even to high school, which yes. is kind of wild. But I'll, I'll pull all of those out and I'll go through and sort of skim through them. And I will um, like highlight or circle or write down lines that I think are interesting or 
something. And then I try to arrange them into a poem. Um, mm. That's my these favorite are, thing. These are your own lines. Yeah, they're my own lines. Although I sometimes do take lines from other places, magazines or something. Yeah. Uh, but more often than not, I, I start with my own lines. And I think I do that because I need to like prove to myself that I have written lines that are interesting and I still can do something. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. totally an ego thing, but it works for me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's great. And um, I love how you mentioned Whitman because one of the things that I loved about Praying Naked is that you're just kind of, a lot of it is kind of like religious imagery and like you have that kind of cadence, but then you also mix the profane and just things that are like, you know, normally I wouldn't put together. Um, so where, where did that come from? Uh, it came from my own sort of personal experience with religion growing up. Um, but also it, it comes from just an interest in how different kinds of language and tones work together. So um, I'll start with what I said first, you know, like I grew up Catholic and um, if, if, if any of you know anything about Catholicism, um, I wasn't like super thrilled with the way that women were portrayed and asked to act yeah. within that True. religion. <laughs> right? Which is sort of like, yeah, you know, I, I don't need to get into it. I'm sure most people know what's up, but um, so I was interested in sort of like profaning the the female role in in that space. And I think actually profane sometimes has a negative connotation, but I, I wanted to sort of give it a kind of power. Mm. Um, and so like thematically, that's what I was interested in. Um, you know, giving a woman, a female speaker, the space, power, and ability to sort of say, fuck you, God. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. like most literally. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, most yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and on the other hand, you know, on a level of like poetics, um, we I mentioned Frank O'Hara before. One thing that I really love about Frank O'Hara's work is his... Um, you know, tendency to talk about, you know, opera and hamburgers in the same poem, like just on a level of language and tone, I think that mixing high and low culture give, can, can give a poem a sort of vitality. Um, it can make it sort of dynamic. And it, it, it tells us a lot about a speaker psychology too. So I didn't want my speaker to only um, be super headstrong and profane. I also wanted her to also have a kind of reverence for this religion that she is rebelling against. Like there's sort of a push and pull. And I, I think that the, the high and low play um, of themes and language hopefully uh, makes my speaker sort of complex in that way. Yeah, no, that, that totally comes through. And even, yeah, you're totally right about profane usually having like a negative connotation, but it felt like more honest and more raw and more true because it wasn't that kind of like shiny <laughs> chaste <laughs> relationship with God. Yeah. Which I, I, yeah, I think it worked really well. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, no, totally. It was, it was good. Um, and oh yeah, I wanted to see, um, will you actually read a poem? I, I know I suggested, um, a poem, which one was it? That, I think it's the seventh day. The, the virgin charm. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to read this one. And I think yeah. it's actually a good one to read because this is actually a poem I wrote out of a collage of older lines. Oh, um, wow. awesome. It came out of prompt. Yeah. So every line in the poem, including the title, um, is something that I had written like sometime between my undergraduate years and I think I like wrote it in 2017. The only things, the only lines that I wrote new were sort of like the dialogue tags. Mm. Um, so if, if people are interested in what kind of collaging can do, you know, um, that's yeah. this poem. Um, and I'd be happy to read it. Yeah, read it. Okay. On the seventh day, God says, what you've got is virgin charm and a knife in your pocket. And I'm like, thanks. The heart finds its anchor in the sky. The woman is told she is a tabernacle. On the 43rd day, I confuse my hangover for grief. God says, your longing will be for me and I will dominate you. And I'm like, nope. 
The morning wears a cotton dress. Is this all I will amount to? The hot breath of months in my pocket, every telephone pole I mistook for a tree, the melancholy suspicion of library security? Nah. The bartender hums the tune of a hummingbird rising from its flower. I say, I inherited Sappho's pussy, and I believe me. God says, thou shalt not kill, and I'm like, but what about with my eyes? I never asked for the capacity to love ugly things, but here I am. Carnation, daisy, lavender lately, the lavender of late. I boil my stock exclusively with wishbones. I say, I like my men smooth and far away, reticent as a bookshelf. And God butts in, I can do that for you. His eyes search me like a pendulum. I've scraped a dead man's ashes out from under my fingernails like lice eggs. A woman raised in contest with other women is a child of God. God says, this is getting serious. And I'm like, you bet. I remember my ignorance and miss it. The skies open silently with a woman's legs. Morning glory, morning glory, morning. Hallelujah. Ah, thank you. Yeah, well, um, I'm going to link to that and some other poems. But yeah, I love that. And knowing that it came from collage, I can I can hear it now. Like, because there are some of those lines are just so, so punchy and they don't have all of the connective tissue, but they don't need it. Like they, they, there's just wonderful gaps in between. And I love the idea that possibly some of those lines were like written years apart and like in different journals. That's amazing. Yeah. It it was certainly a, an exciting one to write. And I think it's the only um, <clears throat> poem in the book that came from a prompt like that. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was something, I would say on the whole, it, I'm sort of generalizing, this isn't true of every poem, but I would say on the whole, the poems in the book in Praying Naked have a sort of like narrative thread or narrative context, yeah. as opposed to being like purely associative leaps or something. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that's just sort of, my taste for this book. And so I sort of liked the energy of that collage that I had written, but I was like, how can I make it a narrative? And so I sort of imposed the dialogue onto the poem. And, and it's the poem that of all of the poems, people will like email me and say that they like, or ask that I read. This is by far the most oh wow. um, asked for one, which is exciting because yeah. um, anyway, uh, I, I digress, but it was, it was so out of left field in terms of like how I usually compose poems that it's exciting to, to hear people sort of respond positively to it. Yeah, totally. And I think that's a really good thing about, you know, uh, different kinds of forms of experimentation is that sometimes you need the reader feedback or like, you know, a journal saying like, yeah, that's my favorite one. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm gonna do that again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good to know. Good to know. And yeah. it's, yeah, and it and it sort of has given me permission to not feel so beholden to my own process. Like I think play and experiment are so important, and you know sometimes yeah we do need the outside validation to say like it works. Totally. But, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's it was a fun one to write. Yeah. Um. And can you talk a little bit about how you arranged um and ordered praying naked like. Did you kind of, I mean, the classic thing is like printing them all out and kind of like moving them around and, and playing with the order that way. But I noticed um, like the moving from origin to resurrection um, and some of the other poems had these lines that seemed to like carry across like them in what matters most has like a hymn and then the next poem is him. And there's all these like sort of little threads sometimes that connect from one poem to the other. Um, how how did that shuffling process happen? Um, well, <clears throat> it took a long time. <laughs> and there were lots of different arrangements that the book had. I, I worked on it for about seven years, you know, wow. from the yeah. first poem to it being a book. And over the course of those years, um, it for a long time, for example, was in two sections and now it's in four. Um, mm. It was longer it was way longer um 
And my my husband, um, who I mentioned in my bio, Richard Hermes, is an insanely talented editor. And he gave me some advice that was really hard to take, actually, but in in the end, helped the book get to its sort of final iteration in terms of arrangement, which was um, to make the book shorter because a lot of poems were in there, they were weaker and they were doing the same work as, as sort of stronger poems. And then he um, pointed out that, you know, on a, on a level of global arrangement, I had sort of all of my rebellious and sort of like louder poems in the first half of the book and sort of more, um, not sad, but you know, morose poems at the second half. And he he suggested that there was sort of like a narrative arc that could be composed. Um, and I think he was right, a sort of like coming of age maybe. Um, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, and so um, <clears throat> in, in, in summary, uh, we he helped me, we spread my poems out all over the floor on my office at the University <laughs> of Tennessee. <laughs> Um, where I was getting my PhD, where we both did. And we we sort of spent a long time arranging it and, and arranged it into four sections that sort of isolated different moments in the speaker's life. Um, mm -hmm. And so tonally, each section is a little bit more diverse than it was originally. But on, on a more sort of, um, on a smaller scale, you know, you were mentioning that some poems sort of have images that feed into the next poem. Yeah. Like, mentioning the moon or mentioning moonlight or something that was uh, that's my favorite kind of thing to arrange for and plan like once we had sections once I had sort of done the the really <laughs> I might have even cried like cutting some of the poems and once I got all that away it was nice to sort of think about um the different ways that each section could be arranged. So some poems transition into one another because there's sort of like an obvious plot line that the, the following poem will develop. Some of them transition into each other tonally because they share a sort of attitude. But the, the most fun um, poems to put next to each other were the ones where the images sort of spoke to one another. It was, it yeah. sort of felt like um, putting together a little puzzle or or creating a crossword, maybe not filling one out. Um, and, and that was really fun. So I just looked for, um, you know, things poems had in common, be it be it tone, narrative, or, or image, and mm -hmm. saw what they would do if they went next to each other. Yeah, no, it really, it works beautifully. And I didn't realize, like the first time I read it, I didn't really catch on to all the flowers either, because I don't, I don't know, it didn't come across as like a very like flowery book, but like on rereading it, I was like, no, there's like, there's wildflowers, there's just, there's all like, there's all sorts of flowers in it. Um, and it, it works really well to like, there are, you know, those, those images really are like rhyming with each other. It's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I, I really love gardening. It's just, that's why there's so many. <laughs> I do too. Love a good but, garden poem. Yeah. I love a good garden. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I love flowers. That's why they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, but really like there's like jo like joyful flowers and then like really like death flowers. Like it's like it really it runs a gamut in that in the collection. It, it's really yeah, it's good. Thank you. Um, Thank you. um there the, uh, I'll just say quickly that I I sometimes am a huge nerd and read field guides for fun. Like I love it. Like yeah, just you know books that explain, you know, the scientific words of flowers and where they grow. And uh, during my MFA, uh, I got I I got at Brazos bookstore, actually, or not Brazos, um, Kaboom, at Kaboom Books. Yeah. I got a, a field guide um, that was published in the 1940s. And all of the, the text about the flowers was like highly poetic and, and sort of, some of them were sort of um, like uh, spooky. And Ooh. the was called How to Know the Wildflowers, which is a poem, which is a title of a poem in one of it, a title of one of the poems in Praying Naked. I sort of lifted it oh, um, yeah. from that field guide and borrowed some of the attitudes that they would use to describe <laughs> the flowers. So they're like, this flower can kill you and you'll, your skeleton will rise into the sky. It was, it's like an amazing, anyway, oh, I'm wow. in a huge I way, need, but. Um, I need that book. <laughs> I will definitely share it with you. It's okay. amazing. Yeah, I need to read it. Um, well, yeah, and I just, I love taking, yeah, I don't know. I love taking things out of context and making them into poems. And it's interesting to get inside people's minds, especially from like the forties when it's like, what do you, what do you really think about these flowers, dude? Yeah. <laughs> like, 
it's amazing and it, it frames itself as a sort of scientific guide but then right. the language is so yeah it's yeah it's amazing I almost said the language is so flowery which it is yeah <laughs> um well I also wanted to pick your brain a little bit about submissions because you've been published in some incredible places um like the New Yorker that little that little magazine <laughs> yeah that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um yeah, like how, so how do you select journals for submissions? A few questions, like what are your dream journals? I mean, the New Yorker is like a dream journal of so many people. So what are what are some more dream journals? Um, how many submissions do you send out a year? Do you have a submission schedule? Um, and I specifically like to hear about the New Yorker one because in another interview you were mentioning that like that poem origin um, was also like a digression of what you would normally write and you were kind of like trying to get out of your own um normal writing routine and that was the one that is like picked up mm -hmm. yeah which was it was i quite literally i put together a packet they they take six poems so i i put five mm -hmm. poems in there that i felt really good about and then i threw origin in at the end it was on the last page i was like i guess i'll throw in that one like <laughs> We'll see. And then the editor, Kevin Young, was like, this is a great poem and I want it. And I was like, wow, cool. Like, that's great. So it was very surprising to me. And it was just another example of uh, sort of outside validation of, mm. of sort of like experiment of something that was an experiment and meant to be sort of playful in my own writing process that was really um, uh, helpful to me moving forward as I wrote. But um, I had been submitting to the New Yorker, which is certainly a dream journal and, and still is. Maybe I'll get published there again someday. We'll yeah. see. Um, but but anyway, you know, the joke jokes aside, um, I had been submitting to the New Yorker every year since 2013. I think I maybe skipped one year. I submitted twice in 2016. I like went back and peaked because I was interested. Um, <laughs> But I submitted six poems every time. I submitted, I think, five times. So I had sent them 30 poems that were rejected by the time that they took one of them. Um, but I just think that, well, I'll say this. I, lately, my approach to submissions has been to move sort of more deliberately and at a slower pace than I had, mm. you know, even four years ago. So some other dream journals that I have are, you know, like the Paris Review or Poetry, of course, I think so many people want to be published there, um, the Kenyan Review. And I, I um, in the past, would have a submission schedule and just sort of throw whatever poems I happen to have at them as the schedule progressed. Yeah. But I've sort of reversed it in, in, in the last few years. I've, I have gone long periods of time not submitting um, at all or or submitting very few poems. In 2019, I also took a peek at this. I only submitted um, to, to five places over the course of the whole year oh, and, wow. and six last year. And I think that's because I'm trying to like intentionally um, put my dream journals first and many of them take a long time to get back to you. So it means that I'm submitting less, um, but I'm also only submitting poems when I absolutely feel like they're ready. Um, not if they're sort of like half ready uh, and, and hope for the best because that's what my schedule says to do. Yeah. Um, well, and so, how, do you, how do you know? How do you know when a poem is ready, ready? Or just like, it's a feeling? I think it's a feeling. Um, I, you know, I give them to other people to read. My, my yeah. uh, Richard reads a lot of my poems and, and helps me, it gives me suggestions for revision. Um, uh, I, I share my poems with, a, with close friends, you know, um, I give you some of my poems sometimes. Yeah. It's been a while, but I haven't done that. Um, anyway, so with, with a lot of sort of like community input, um, I, I really found the workshop space in graduate school to be really helpful with helping me get poems ready for submission. I, I tend to feel like when I have other people's eyes on it, I have a better sense of when the box clicks shut, as, as Yates said, about how to end a poem. Mm -hmm. um, when I sort of isolate myself, I have no idea. Um, but that's just me, you know? everyone handles it differently. So that's how, that's how I know when it's gone through a few phases of revision with other people's eyes on it. But um, yeah, I, I think I'm digressing a little bit, but in short, um, my submissions process lately has been like really getting poems ready and then submitting to the places I really want to get into first. Mm -hmm. And then once they're rejected from every single one of those places, um, going to like my 
my second list of dream journals, like second place dream journals or something. Yeah, totally. <laughs> kind of silly maybe, but, um, or no, it doesn't. I don't think that sounds silly. I'm going to correct that. Um, <laughs> so that's how I, that's how I go about it. Yeah. yeah. It takes a long time, but my yeah, percentage of acceptance is, is higher since I've done it that way, as opposed to putting the schedule first and the, the poem quality second, if that makes sense. No, totally. Yeah. And I, I was going to ask too, like what, um, what advice do you have for people who are, are newer to the submission process? Like you've gone through, you know, all these years and have moved from submitting a lot to like submitting a little less, but if you had like time machine to go back to talk to first submitting Katie, like, is there anything that you would tell yourself? I think that's a really good question. Um, one thing that I do for my students and one thing that a professor had done for me when I first started submitting poems is I show them my submittable page and I show them all of the rejections that I've gotten over the years mm. um, and compared to the amount of acceptances, which like, it's just my rejections page is like seven pages long. Wow. And my acceptance, yeah. my acceptances aren't even like, there's not even a second page on submittable to click to. And so that's one piece of advice I would give anyone and, and my younger self too, I'd give that I, get, I would give her advice, that advice again, because as we've said earlier in our conversation, getting outside validation can be so valuable, yeah. um, but actually it doesn't happen that much. And so it's important that we don't rely on that validation um, because rejection is just inevitable and more frequent than, than it getting accepted to journals. It's just the way it is. So that's, I would just say like, don't lose your sense of self um, when you get rejections. Um, there's a great poem by Merwin about called Berryman about all of the advice that the poet mm -hmm. Berryman had given him. Yeah. Um, and he there's a line where he says to like paper your wall with rejection slips and oh, to not yeah. lose your like um what's do you remember the word like don't lose your confidence too soon your arrogance yeah. he says yeah. to be a little arrogance. arrogant yeah. And I think that's really important, actually, when you start submitting poems, like you have to believe in yourself to send them out. Yeah. And I, as I said, I, like I sent out so many poems, I mean, lots, lots and lots when I was young. And I don't know if I would advise against that, you know, um, I just yeah, have I, maybe my both is what you need to do. Yeah. 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 But so that's the succinct version of the advice that I'd, I'd give someone who's just starting out, be a little arrogant be prepared for rejection. And when you get that validation, like really feel awesome about it. And, and um, yeah. Yeah. You deserve it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like that. Um, and then I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, what, what are some of your favorite books and like, it could be people or books that just came out or just like, who, who would you recommend that, that people don't read enough of? Well, I have, I have like a whole stack of books that have been published in like the last five years below mm -hmm. me sort of show off, but books that are, um, okay, like, for it. I will, yeah. um, I'll say just two books that have been very important to my writing life. Um, uh, the Bernadette Mayer just in general as a poet, I think is someone who not many people read. She's a second generation New York school poet and her book, it's a little purple book called a Bernadette Mayer reader is just so phenomenal. She's, you know, formally experimental, but not so much so that, you know, her work is unapproachable. Um, she, for example, uh, writes like a bunch of experimental sonnets. One of them is called, You Jerk, You Didn't Call Me Up. And uh, the first couple lines are, You Jerk, You Didn't Call Me Up. I haven't seen you in so long. You probably have a fucking tan. So she's just like, like <laughs> coarse and funny, but like yeah. her poetics are so interesting and smart. Um, so I think she's really wonderful. Um, and the uh, another book that's in incredibly important to me is um, called Black Life by Dorothy Alasky, who, oh, yeah. who I think people read and, and I hope they do. If you don't, you should check her out. All of her books are great, but that one was really influential to me. Um, and then books that I've read lately um, I guess this is just the library version of it, but Simulacra by Aria D. Matthews um, won the Yale Younger Poets Prize in 2017. And I think it's just a phenomenal book. Um, she's also sort of formally experimental. She also has lots of um, 
conversations with other poets. She um, has a series of poems in here that are text messages with Anne Sexton. It's just Ooh. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. I think you would actually really love it, Layla, if you, if you haven't read it. Um, I haven't. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's been on my list, but I, I haven't read it. I, I love the idea of text messages with Anne Sexton. They're really amazing. The whole book is great. Um, uh, High Ground Coward by Alicia Mountain was published, mm. I think, two years ago. Um, she writes uh, beautifully about queer desire, um, and she does it in sort of like a quirky, sort of whimsical, but also like highly intellectual way. I, I would say I'm trying to think of like poets to compare her to, but I, I, re I really think she's sort of in a, in a school of her own. It's an amazing book. Um, Company by Sam Ross. It, you could see how. Yeah, I know. I love your sticky notes. Um, I think this is an absolutely beautiful book. Um, and it, uh, Carl Phillips selected this for the Larry Levis Prize in Poetry at Four Away Books. But this is just, it's a, it's a beautiful book. It's a, a bunch of lyric poems, um, again, about, about queer love. But he, he is so measured, but warm. Um, you know, he, he's amazing. So anyway, I'm going to keep going. So I have like, I have four more books and I, I don't <laughs> belabor this. I Second love it. You've got the stack there. I do. Second Empire by Richie Hoffman, I think is a beautiful book. Oh, he yeah, sort of like reminds me of Henri Cole. Um, lots of sort of sonnet-esque poems. Um, really beautiful. <clears throat> Rodeo in Reverse by Lindsay Alexander. She's okay. sort of... Um, her poems are sort of like talky, conversational, very funny, um, but also like sort of dreamscapes a little bit, I would say. Um, it's fantastic. This uh, book by Allison Patini Davis called Line Study of a Motel Clerk. Mm. Uh, she, uh, some of the poems are written in persona, but it's, it's about, um, a, a motel clerk that her family owns a motel and she's her poems are funny they're sharp um and they're you know they're about a family living in the rust belt a working class family i think it's really amazing and then last but not least um american radiance by louisa Maradian. if Ooh, you what a cover isn't it beautiful um if you are someone who doesn't believe that poems can be funny and also be good or if you are a person who loves funny poems uh, please read Louisa's book. It's absolutely amazing. I think it's maybe my favorite book that I've read in the last few years. It's just wow. really remarkable. Um, so that's my like huge stack of books that I would have read. Okay. <laughs> just I love seeing all the covers. Will you actually, I, I meant to ask you before, will you hold up your cover? Because oh, I, yeah. I have the e-version on my phone, which I can hold up. Yes. I just, I love the rattlesnake. Um, and which she's yeah, tan lines I don't know if you can see on the screen. oh you know what? I never noticed the tan lines I think that's my favorite detail the words sort of cover it a little bit but yeah, but yeah well I remember when you very first showed me like the options for the cover and all of them were amazing I mean it was like woman like naked woman with snake is like <laughs> praying naked that's just oh it's amazing the the painter who painted I I just took all of my options from her with her permission her name's Doriel Kaimi and she's just fantastic. I mean, this is one of her more like straight ahead paintings. Many of her other paintings get really weird and sort of surreal, but they all almost always have the female figure, um, you know, featured prominently. And I just think that that's, I think she's a phenomenal painter, um, sort of representing the female body the way that it actually is. Yeah. Um, like it's tummy rolls and sunburn. Yeah, it's, it's such a good, yeah. I, the whole cover is really good, but I, um, I need to look at more for artwork. Which yeah, like, that's a that's a conversation for another day. But I love like cover design now with with different poetry collections. Like some of them are just too good. I agree. Yeah. The yeah, lately they've just been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, Katie, thank you so much for chatting. I think that's that's all the time we have um, for now. But I'm I'm excited to read your new poems. We're gonna link to a bunch of them in the notes and um, and then whenever the ones that are forthcoming, where are you getting published? Tell us. Uh, uh, forthcoming. I have a poem that was just recently published in Plowshares um, called Married Six Months, I Dream of the Ex I Long Thought I'd Marry. Yeah, uh, 
My husband helped me edit. Actually, <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, and I have two poems coming out in um, Poetry Northwest. One of the titles is very long. In fact, I don't even think I could remember the whole thing, which is so funny. <laughs> um, and the other one is called um, Called Back. Uh, so that's very exciting. And um, I will keep you updated if if anything else ha- happens. Yeah, perfect. Well, I'm gonna, yeah, we'll link to those and then we'll update um, when they're all out. So yeah, um, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to reading more stuff. Thank you so much for having me. It was a huge pleasure to talk with you.